Okay, and now moving on to part three, the origin of cumulative cultural evolution, trying to understand why uh, human culture evolve uh, so easily through cumulative cultural evolution when non-human animal culture uh, does not. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the paper by Tomasello in 1993 sparked the interest into uh, cumulative cultural evolution, the modern interest at least, into uh, this field. And Tomasello introduced the idea of a ratchet effect. So the idea of the ratchet is simply that you have a wheel uh, that is going to turn in only one direction because uh, the ratchet is making it impossible for the wheel to turn into the other direction. And the analogy with culture was that in humans, when you have a new invention, when you have a new idea, that idea is going to spread and it cannot go back, it's not going to disappear. So why is that? So Tomasello argued that once a new modification is introduced, it can easily be passed on to other individuals through various means of social learning. And Facebook transmission is essential. It prevents the loss of modifications and therefore produce cultural uh, accumulation. And the reason is that if you have faithful social learning, then new ideas are just going to be passed on and they are no, never going to be uh, degraded and modified and they are going to stick around. And eventually what is socially transmitted goes beyond what a single individual could invent on their own. And this is often taken as a sort of benchmark. So if you find something like, like this, it's obviously cumulative cultural evolution because it goes beyond what one individual can do and therefore is necessarily linked to several, to the accumulation of several modifications. And Tenier and colleagues in 2009 extended this uh, idea in their paper, Ratcheting Up the Ratchet, uh, extending the notion to the zone of latent solution. Uh, and there the idea is that uh, humans have managed to go beyond what one individual can do. They go beyond what they uh, are able to learn in general, whereas non-human animals are stuck within, their, within a zone in which they can learn new things, but this is the sort of thing that they can learn uh, within their lifetimes, uh, not things that go beyond what one individual can do. Um, I'm just going to give you one study, one example in which uh, individuals, the researchers, were trying to uh, tackle these different questions. And this is a study by Dean and colleagues in 2012. And they used, they based their study uh, on previous studies using puzzle boxes. And they made this big, large, complex uh, puzzle box uh, that they gave to participants that were chimpanzees, capuchin monkeys, and uh, human children. And the idea was that you can open the box uh, in three different stages that are uh, getting more and more complex, uh, but also more and more rewarding. So here we're looking at the example with chimp of these, and you see the box uh, in front of you, and you have three different kinds of rewards, uh, carrots, apple, and grapes, okay, in this order. Um, and so at the beginning of the experiment, the two gray doors are closed, and when you slide the door on one side, you can reveal the carrot and you can find the carrot. And then if you press one of the two buttons on the white bars at the top or bottom, then if you press the button, you can slide the door a little bit further and reveal the second uh, food item, an apple. And then if you turn the wheel on the side with the blue and green uh, buttons, if you turn the wheel, then you can slide the door even further and then get the grape, which is the highest value reward for uh, the chimpanzees. So what Dean and colleagues found uh, was the following. So you have capuchins in yellow, chimpanzees in red, and children in blue with the different stages. Stage zero, you don't open anything. Stage one, you slide the door on one side. Stage two, you press a button, slide the door, and retrieve the second reward. And stage three, uh, you manage to do everything and get the three uh, rewards. And what you see there uh, is that only children manage to really get to stage three. Uh, but the capuchins and the chimpanzees, some of them manage to learn new techniques uh, for the capuchins uh, stage two, and for the chimps even one with uh, stage three. But these did not spread within the group. They remained stuck basically on the first solution that they had uh, come up with. And that is something that we find in many experiments when we are trying to look at improvements or different techniques. Once the monkeys or the apes have found a solution to a particular technique, they tend to stick to it. 
Uh, you can also see a similar example, a somewhat similar study um, by Vail and, and colleagues uh, described in details in lecture 10 by uh, Andy Whiten. Um, so why is human social learning faithful and animal social learning not faithful? Well, Thomas Hill and colleagues uh, proposed the following in, in 93 in cultural learning paper. Humans share with other animals many social learning mechanisms, but humans are unique in their capacity to take the perspective of others. So when we, when we are doing a task together, say two individuals working on something, then uh, the same goes, you know, you, you can put yourself into somewhere, someone else's shoe. Uh, so you can take the perspective of another individual and see the problem from their perspective, their side. And apparently, I mean, according to Thomas and colleague, this is something that only humans are capable of doing. And still, according to Thomas Hello and colleagues, perspective taking allows the faithful cultural transmission. And that is the reason why we have a cumulative cultural evolution uh, in humans. So, Caldwell and Millen, for instance, in a series of studies, uh, try to tackle this question by introducing a new task in which participants, uh, human participants, were faced with a complex uh, technological problem. So in this instance, for instance, they had to build spaghetti towers, so towers based on spaghetti and play-doh. Uh, in other experiments, for instance, they had to build uh, paper aeroplanes, paper planes, uh, and make them fly as fast as possible. And Caldwell and Millen, uh, across the different studies, uh, showed uh, that uh, human participants are very good at improving based on what others have been doing before. So here you see in this picture, in the first row, this is the first generation of towers. In the second row, this is the last generation of towers from 10 different uh, transmission chains. And what you see is that there is a clear improvement, and you find that in, in uh, the paper plane study and also in the spaghetti tower study. Uh, but you can imagine that you, you can use information from various sources. So you can uh, improve your construction when you're talking to people. Uh, so if you see someone and you can talk to them and they can explain to you what they've done, what has failed, this is going to uh, make a big impression on you and that can change, help you uh, build a higher tower. But just seeing the picture of a solution, so imagine that we somebody shows you the solution, so the, the, the tower that you find in the last generation, then it becomes pretty obvious what you have to do. So you don't need to talk to someone or take their perspective to solve the problem. Uh, you just need to be exposed to uh, a solution, and that works too. And so Caldwell and Millen found that a variety of social learning mechanisms from uh, announcement to basic exposure to uh, talking and teaching uh, all of that is going to produce cumulative control evolution. So perspective taking doesn't seem to be that important to produce cumulative control evolution. Still, you might think that um, although we find cumulative control evolution using a variety of different social learning mechanisms in humans, well, maybe in humans, uh, social learning mechanisms are very faithful in general. Uh, Indeed, if you think about the original argument by Thomas and and colleagues, uh, cumulative culture is the outcome of uh, social learning fidelity. If you don't have social learning, uh, faithful social learning, how are you going to develop uh, cumulative cultural evolution? That's one idea that we wanted to study uh, in my lab. And we decided to build a system in which we could study control transmission and cultural evolution uh, using non-human uh, animals, non-human primates, and in this case, in particular, baboons. And I'm going to present these uh, different studies and results uh, right now. Here you see uh, the lab that was built and developed by Joël Fago in Marseille. And in this lab, you have uh, about 20 guinea baboons who are living into their normal enclosure. And then they have access to these little cubicles, and inside the cubicles uh, there is a computer, and the computer can recognize each baboon individually, and then present tasks on a touch screen, and then the baboon can respond to the task by uh, simply touching the screen. And so we decided to use this setup to study uh, cumulative cultural evolution. And I'm going to use the task that we use first, 
And it's a simple memory task, and you will see a grid of four by four squares, and there are 12 white ones and four red ones. And the four red squares are going to disappear uh, very, very quickly. Okay, I'm going to show you one trial, four red squares, and then they disappear. And then second trial, again, red squares, they disappear, and then the baboon give a response. Uh, and so we use this simple memory task to build transmission chains. And I'm just going to outline the design of the experiment here. So on the left hand side, you see initial random grids that were randomly picked by the computer. And these grids were presented to the first baboon in blue. And then we recorded the response of that baboon. That's a second uh, column of grid. And then we use the responses to create a new set of stimuli uh, that was based on the response. That's a third column with the red squares. And this set of stimuli was presented to the second baboon, and the second baboon gave a response, and that response was used to the next baboon, and so on and so forth. So basically what the, baboon, uh, what the baboons had to do after the first generation was to touch the squares that were touched by the previous baboon. So it's a form of copy task. And before these uh, transmission trials, uh, we exposed the baboon to random control trials, meaning the computer would simply pick a grid at random, present it to the baboon and record the response. And in the results, we are going to compare the outcome of transmission trials to random control trials. So in this experiment, we found, first of all, we found an important increase in success over time. So at the beginning of the experiment, uh, at the first generation, the baboons were on average 80% correct. And for transmission trials in blue, you see that this success rate increases for uh, up to 95% compared to random trials, where it remains uh, constant or slightly decreasing over time. And this increase in success was linked to the emergence of particular structures. So here we've color coded uh, the different grids. Of course, during the experiment, they were all red squares. Uh, but here in black, you will see uh, sort of different patterns. And then in color, you will see all the grids where the four squares are connected to each other. And this connection is called a tetromino, these different shapes. And there are five different types of tetrominoes. So in the first generation, you see that there are very uh, few tetrominoes. That's the sixth generation. And that's the twelfth generation. And you see that there is a very important increase in this number of tetrominoes. And that explained the success of the baboons uh, at the task. Moreover, we were able to reproduce the same experiment, the same transmission chain several times. So we did it six times. And then we compared the outcome of the different chains. So this is a representation of the different proportions of the different tetrominoes and the non tetromino uh, for the six different chains at the last generation. And on the left hand side, you have the expected proportion based on the random mixture of the different grids, of the different chains, sorry. And what you see is that some chains are very different from others. So for instance, chain one has lots of lines and chain two has lots of L's and so on and so forth. So doing the same experiment different times revealed that we would find different, slightly different outcomes, always tetrominoes in the end, but slightly different proportions of tetrominoes. And that uh, mirrors in some way or resemble uh, the divergence that you can find in language evolution, for instance, when you start with one language and then it diverges across time. So what does this tell us about uh, cumulative control evolution and the fidelity of social learning? So in this experiment, we found an increasing score, the emergence of structure and linear specificity. Three different properties that are typical of uh, human cumulative control evolution. And all this happened with extremely low fidelity. Okay. So in the first generation, for instance, uh, we had 30%, only 37% of the grids that were reproduced accurately without any errors. That means that uh, 63% of the grids were changed at each uh, generation. And this incredibly low level of fidelity did not prevent the emergence of uh, these complex uh, phenomena. And what we also found that was more surprising to us is that fidelity, fidelity increased sharply uh, during the transmission chains. And at the end, in the last generation, 72% of the grids were reproduced without any errors. And this really suggests that 
high fidelity, when we see high fidelity uh, transmission in nature, that could be the outcome of the evolutionary process and not necessarily the source of uh, cumulative cultural evolution. But you might think that this is still a sort of copy task, okay? Because the baboons had to touch the squares that were touched by the previous baboon. So it's really a memory task and a copying task. So next we thought we could do something quite different and try to test baboons in the same setup, but with a task that would not involve copying. So we designed the following task. <coughs> and the task here <coughs> is simply that you see four green, green squares this time, and your task is simply to not touch the squares that were green. And then the square that you touch are going to be the green square for the next baboon. So in this task, compared to the previous one, uh, where you had just one possible response, you, you had to touch the four different red squares. In this task, you can touch any square. Any square but the four green ones will do and will get you a reward. And amazingly, in this task, we found uh, nearly the same results as in the previous experiment. We found an increase in score, the emergence of structures, and linear specificity, but with a different spatial organization. And I'm just going to show you the kind of result that we found. So this is the first uh, lineage, so the first transmission chain, and you're going to see generation 9 at the top and 10 at the bottom. And it's a sample of the different grids of this uh, transmission chain. And you see that you still find the terminals, but they are specially organized. So if you look at generation nine, you see that almost all the terminals are in the top two rows. And in generation 10, almost all of them are in the bottom two rows. And with this transmission chain, you see that in generation nine, almost all of them are in the uh, right hand side. And in generation 10, almost all of them are on the left hand side. And this shows that even with a non-copying task, and therefore no fidelity, you can find cumulative cultural evolution, and you can still see the emergence of complex patterns over time. So what does this tell us about the origin of cumulative cultural evolution? Well, you see that cumulative cultural evolution can evolve, happen uh, with a variety of social learning mechanisms and also with extremely low fidelity. And even with a task that is a non-copying task, where it's changing every single generation, the response is changing every generation. So that suggests that we should find uh, cumulative cultural evolution in non-human animals. So why is there this huge gap between animal culture and human cultural evolution? Well, no one knows, uh, and it's a still a very active field of research. But I'm going to share with you my personal opinion on this on this question. So when you think about the previous experiments uh, where we found cumulative cultural evolution or something like it in the songs of whales, in the songs of birds, in the pigeons uh, uh, traveling routes, then this task, what they have in common is that they are language-like, so to speak. They have a large evolutionary space, so there is, you can go in very different directions. So the vocalization, they can be very varied and the routes to go from point A to point B, you can take a variety of routes and still go from point A to point B. They have this huge evolutionary space, and then they, have, they often have multiple responses uh, that are more or less equivalent. Again, in, the, in terms of vocalization, you can have different kinds of vocalization that are still going to serve the same, the same purpose, are still going to work, uh, as we've seen in the case of humpback whale songs. And also in the case of the pigeon roots, although they are not optimal, then you know there is a pattern that is more or less acceptable. Even if it's not the perfect route, then you can have variations around that uh, particular route. And that suggests to me that there is a strong link between uh, language evolution and cumulative cultural evolution. So my opinion is that to understand the evolution of uh, cumulative cultural evolution, we need to understand the evolution of language. And of course, the problem is we don't know what happened for the evolution of language. We have no idea. And it's a very hard question. And again, it's a very active field of uh, research. But I think you can outline two broad uh, categories of theories that will link language evolution to cumulative cultural evolution. The first one is a social hypothesis. 
and it's linked to the evolution of social intelligence. And in that case, the idea is that uh, human and non-human animal complexification of social life led to the emergence of complex social cognition, and that created language that gave rise to cumulative cultural evolution, very roughly. And the second hypothesis is the ecological hypothesis, and that is more linked to the evolution of technologies. And there, the idea is that we face complex, uh, difficult environments that, was that were probably changing all the time, and to adapt to these environments, we had to develop particular technologies to process food, to protect us, and so on and so forth. And that gave rise to uh, more, um, more evolved forms of communication that gave rise to language and to cumulative cultural evolution. So again, very roughly, I'm not trying to describe this in many details, but just to give you a broad idea, you can compare the two different uh, scenarios in the following way. So the social hypothesis, the environment created selection for an increasingly complex social life. And that created a unique set of social cognitive abilities, an increased reliance on communication and language, and that gave rise to cumulative cultural evolution. So language emerged and that gave rise to cumulative cultural evolution almost everywhere. And the ecological hypothesis, the environment created selection for increased reliance on tools and technologies and more tolerance, more coordination, more cooperation between individuals and therefore developed social learning mechanisms that gave rise to language and to cumulative cultural evolution. That's the two distinct scenarios to explain the relationship between language and cumulative cultural evolution. So just to summarize part three, where does cumulative cultural evolution come from? Well, we don't know. Really, we don't know and we are still trying to understand that. But we've learned two things. The first thing is that cumulative cultural evolution can emerge with a variety of social learning mechanisms. And then cumulative cultural evolution does not require high fidelity cultural transmission. Thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, lecture. I hope you have, that you have enjoyed the different videos. And if you have any question or you want to get in touch, please use my email or visit my website. Thank you very much. Bye bye.